The other day I posted a very long video that has a lot of things going on towards an interesting conclusion, but I decided to cut away this part and post it again by itself because this can be an introduction to inverse functions and that other video would be too much if you were only looking for an introduction to inverse functions. So here we go. So how does an inverse function work? I'm going to do the inverse function of this one that is on my picture right now. But in order to sketch the inverse of a function whose graph you already have, what you have to do is to look at the line y equals x, which I'm putting here in gray in the picture. And then what you're going to want to draw is the reflection of the red graph over this y equals x line because when you have the graph of the f of x function they are points of the form x y obviously uh, the x coordinate is horizontal and the y coordinate is vertical uh, but the points in the red graph are points whose coordinates x and y obey this relationship here y equals f of x and the meaning of an inverse function is a function which we call this unfortunate notation such that it's the opposite x is the function of y so graphically what that means is that the inverse function switches the role of x and y so where x was horizontal it's going to become vertical because it is now the dependent variable of this new function that we're making and the y variable is going to become horizontal because it is now the independent variable. Of course, we're not going to draw it like that because if we did, it would be uh, just the same picture again. But when we sketch the graph of the inverse function, what we do is we switch the names of the variables so that the independent variable is still called x like it usually is so it's still here horizontally every point x y in the red graph is going to have to have a corresponding point y x in the green graph so for example this y intercept here is going to become an x intercept here and this x intercept here is going to become a y intercept here also interesting points are the points where the graph of f of x crosses the y equals x line because on those points if you switch y and x nothing happens because they are the same number they are in the line y equals x so those points actually belong to both graphs the green graph is going to be going through here as well and for all other points i just want to do this visually really as drawing a reflection graphically i think that this is easier when the function is closer to the y equals x line so i tend to start here because this bit is easier to draw uh, and then i just go from there and also here here is kind of easy because it's the point where they are both together so now i have to reach the other point and then from this point i have to connect to the other point but now I'm going to be a little bit careful because in order to get to this point, to that point, I can't just go in whichever way I want, right? I have to make it look like a reflection of the red graph. I'm getting closer to the line where the red one also gets closer. And then here you see that it gets a little bit farther away. So I am also going to go a little bit farther away, just trying to make it look like a reflection. There you go. That's an exercise that I really like graphically sketching the inverse of a function. It's interesting that you don't need to have an expression for f of x in order to do this exercise. Like f of x is equal to the square root of x plus x to the power of 3. You don't need anything like that. You just need a sketch and then you put a diagonal line over there and then you make another sketch. Also worth noting at this point is that not every function f of x that I could have put here in the exercise would have an inverse function. In other words, not every function is invertible. An invertible function is one that has an inverse function. And the thing is that when you draw the reflection, 
the green thing that I drew here still wants to be a function. And in order for a graph to be a function, it needs to pass the vertical line test. And this one does. Every vertical line that I put here in the graph, you see it's only crossing my green function once. Was this luck or did I know what to do with my original red function in order for this to be an okay example? Well, the thing is that, like I mentioned, the inverse function is switching x and y. So everything that was x becomes y and vice versa. Uh, and there are some consequences of that switching of x and y. For example, we've already mentioned in the previous example that a y-intercept is going to become an x-intercept and vice versa. That's kind of obvious because I'm switching x and y, so literally the x-intercept becomes the y-intercept. But other things can be less obvious. For example, if I start with an exponential function here, this is my f of x. And now I'm going to sketch the inverse function to that. So I need my y equals x line here to reflect over. And I'm going to switch the y-intercept with an x-intercept. I'm going to get closer to the line here as the red one does. And then I'm going to go farther away again over there like I was talking about in the previous example. But I am switching everything x for everything y. So x is horizontal and y is vertical which means that I am switching everything horizontal for everything vertical and vice versa. But this red function here has a horizontal asymptote, which means that the blue one is going to have a vertical asymptote, which I am putting right here. Uh, the equation of the horizontal asymptote of the red one was y equals zero. And so I am switching x and y, right? So the equation of the vertical asymptote of the blue function is x equals 0. Of course, uh, if you already know that I am talking about exponential function here, of course, this is a logarithmic function down in the other one. That's where the vertical asymptote for the logarithmic functions comes from. It's from the fact that it's the inverse function of something that has a horizontal asymptote. But uh, another interesting thing that also switches x and y in not as immediately obvious a way is that when you talk about the domain of a function, that is all the possible values of x. And when you talk about the range of a function, that is all the possible values of y. So domain and range also has to be switched when you're doing inverse functions, uh, which is why the domain of an exponential function is all real numbers and the range of the logarithmic function is all real numbers, but the range of the exponential function is only the positive numbers, which means that the domain of the logarithmic function is just the positive numbers. That's where that comes from as well. Okay, so I'm not going to talk a lot about exponential functions and logarithmic functions in this video. I do have another video that is all about exponential functions. I'm going to link that in the description as well. But what we were talking about here is the fact that in order for the red function to be invertible, then its inverse function, the blue function, needs to pass the vertical line test. And this one does pass the vertical line test because every purple vertical line that I am putting here is only crossing the blue function once. But the way that I could have seen already in the red function that that was going to work is by looking at horizontal lines. Because look, I am switching everything horizontal with everything vertical. So if my blue function is going to pass the vertical line test, then I need my original red function to pass a horizontal line test. And the exponential function certainly does pass that test, as does my previous example. Look, my red function here also passes a horizontal line test, which means that once I reflect it over the y equals x line, the new function, the green one, will pass the vertical line test. So it is a function. So it is the inverse function of the red one, and the red one is invertible. Now, the only way for a function to not pass the horizontal line test, and therefore to not be an invertible function, is if once it crosses a particular horizontal line, 
it comes back down and crosses it again. This doesn't stop the function itself from being a function because it is still passing vertical line test here as it goes up and down. But because it went up and down, it's crossing the horizontal line multiple times. So if I tried to invert that, then I would get a green function that is going to the left and to the right, something like this. Look, this is not a function. This doesn't pass the vertical line test because the red one did not pass the horizontal line test. So the moral of the story is in order for a function to be invertible, it can't have any local minimum or local maximum because when you reflect that, it would make something that goes to the left and to the right, and a function cannot do that. But first, I want to tell you about the other type of inverse function exercise that I really like, uh, which is to invert a function algebraically. I am a very big fan of graphical exercises in a variety of contexts, including this one that I've just showed you. I really like inverting functions graphically. But I also like to do this one algebraically as well. So here is a particularly complicated looking example. Let's just go through the steps of how you invert a function algebraically. Hopefully you will see that there's nothing exactly complicated about this example. It just looks funny. Uh, but the thing is that you begin such a thing by remembering that the points in the graph of this function are the points x and y such that y equals f of x, right? So we can take away this f of x here and just put y equals that. And then the second thing that you're going to remember is that when you want to invert a function, you have to switch the roles of x and y. So this y here is going to become an x, and that x is going to become a y. Of course, if we had multiple occurrences of the letter x in the expression of this function, you would have to change all of them to the letter y but because in my example I only had one, so I just did it once. And by the way, the fact that there was only one is the reason why I say that this example is not particularly difficult, okay? Because everything that you need to do now is to isolate y in this equation here. So you're going to do that by just doing inverse operations a bunch of them in the correct order as needed here until y is isolated. And I do have a whole other video talking about that kind of exercise. But for here, let's just do it, right? So we'll begin by subtracting two on both sides. And now we are going to put both sides of this equation to the power of three. Um, I am not sure if it would be important at this moment to expand this x minus 2 to the power of 3 here but uh, just in case you want to do it just make sure you do it correctly right because it would be a very bad mistake to do this ouch it hurts that's not how this goes at all this uh this requires a binomial expansion right i also have videos about that uh but to the power of 3 means that you put x to the power of 3 then minus well, it's going to be 6 now because it's 3 times this 2. The next one is 3 times 2, 2. So it's 12 here, x, and minus 8 finally, which is 2 to the power of 3. I don't usually do that, though, in the kind of um, inverse function exercise, okay? I'm just going to leave it like that and now subtract 7 from both sides. Finally, divide both sides by 2 and take the fifth root on both sides to get this very beautiful looking answer right here. Uh, there is a specific reason why in the beginning I chose odd numbers for both the index of the root and the exponent in there. It's because odd degree power functions uh, look like this. So they pass the horizontal line test, whereas even degree power functions they look like this, kind of like a quadratic function, so they don't pass the horizontal line test, and therefore I don't like putting them in algebraic inverse function exercises. However, that is exactly what I'm going to do today. I want to talk about the inverse function of functions that are not invertible, so I'm going to start with this quadratic function. Uh, we are actually not going to do that in this video, 
that's what I was doing in the other longer video that this was originally cut out from. So the link to that is also in the description of this video. So if you are curious to see where that was going, you can go to the other video and skip this part that you've already watched.